Uh, I, first, I want to thank um, the beautiful panel who spoke before me because, unbeknownst to you, everything you said is actually everything I'm already going to say. So you've already said it all, but it helps me to understand that I'm right on where I should be. So I'm presenting to you today my illumination presentation. All right, here we go. My story is called Mmm, not to be confused with Oom. Mm. So it's Mmm because I find that fascinating. You know, when you learn certain things, you go Mmm. Mm. So that's what's today. It's a very, very personal story. And I want to thank Rohan for giving me permission to be vulnerable and share this with you. I have tissue just in case I cry. I hope I do, because I don't cry enough. Um, this is so personal. Um, the story I'm going to tell you, the bulk of it happened over nine years ago. And I was, it was too sacred and I was too scared to share it because I didn't want to think, I didn't want anyone to think I was crazy. And you'll find out. So let's start from the beginning. Oh, how'd that happen? Oh, there we go. That's me, five years old. Um, laser. There. This is my grandmother. My maternal grandma, this is my mother. And it was my grandmother that um, was psychic and um, it suffered greatly, uh, came to Canada um, as, as a um, refugee and started a new life here. And she had 10 children and she, it, greatly poor. And she was lived in Duncan, BC. My mother was the youngest of 10 children. And, and I'm the third generation. Oh, I'm so cute, aren't I? Look at that. <laughs> but what's interesting about the story I'm going to tell you is I never knew any of these things about my childhood. My, my parents were really all about modesty and humbleness, and they never really praised us. And it wasn't until I became an adult where my mom would tell me stories about me when I was young. And this is one of them. She says, when you were in kindergarten, hang on here, that's me five years old. When you were in kindergarten, your dad and I got a call from your kindergarten teacher. And she said, Mr. and Mrs. G, uh, we would like to have a parent um, teacher conversation about your daughter. And my parents right away thought, oh my God, what has she done? So they showed up at this meeting, and the first thing my dad said was, oh my God, what has she done? And the teacher said, oh, Mr. and Mrs. G, it's such a delight to meet you. It's not what Tanya did, it's what Tanya does. And she went on to tell them that when there was a child crying, that I would stop what I was doing, I would run over and comfort the child and say, it's okay, your mommy's coming back for you. And when it was snack time, I would jump up and help distribute the snacks and just would naturally leave the last one for me. And when it was nap time, I would run around and tuck all the kids in and kiss them on the forehead. And so the teacher said, you know, Mr. and Mrs. G, I really wanted to meet you because I wanted to know how is it that you raised such a cute child. And my parents looked at each other and went, we have no clue. She didn't learn that from us. Typical Chinese family. All right, this is the um, summary of my talk today. It's about innocence. It's about reclaiming that childlike innocence. It's about love, and it's about your compassionate heart. When I was six years old, we went to Hawaii, and um, I, my mom and dad said, you have a little bit of money, would you like to buy something? And I said, I want that. I want that thing. And my mom says, do you know what it is? I said, yeah, it's a happy fat man. <laughs> There's a theme to my speech, you'll figure it out. Okay, that's cute. Mmm, cute. Okay. When I was in my mid-30s, um, I divorced for the first time. No, just kidding. Married for the first time, divorced. Married a second time, hopefully I'll stick. Okay, this is Anna. Anna is a brilliant friend of mine. That she's, I can you read this here? She's a counselor, a healer, a creepily accurate psychic, and giver of life-changing predictions. When you get a call from Anna, 
you're totally scared. So it went something like this. Ring. Hello? Tanya? Anna? You should come for dinner. Why? I have something to tell you. Can you tell me now? No. Come for dinner. It's personal. Oh, God. Okay. I'll be there tomorrow. So um, I showed up. Because you just never know what she's going to say, right? And remember, she's creepily accurate and um, the giver of life-changing predictions. So we're having dinner, and the whole time I'm like, totally, like, stomach's getting all crazy. And I'm like, okay, just stop. I said, what are you going to tell me? And she puts the fork down. And she's like, you know, Tanya, I've been meditating a lot, and you keep coming into my meditations, not just one or twice. We're talking a lot. And I said, yeah, and? And she said, you're going to meet a monk. And I'm like, what? And she's like, this is no typical monk. This is a Tibetan Buddhist monk. And I said, okay, so I'm going to meet a Tibetan Buddhist monk. She goes, yeah, where in Vancouver can you meet a Tibetan Buddhist monk? And she's like, I have no clue. And I said, come on. She's like, nope, I don't, can't get anything else past that. And I said, when is this going to happen? You have a clue? And she's, she just said, just tell me when it happens. So I'm like, I just, okay, fine. Banked it, right? Two years later, I'm working, I still work today, in a medical building. It's a dental medical building. And they have a little pharmacy downstairs. And back in the day, I used to wear a lab coat. Oh, I don't do that anymore. And um, I was downstairs in a pharmacy, and I got mistaken as someone who works there. And I hear this voice. Excuse me, do you have polysporin eye drops? And then I, I'm like, what? I turn around, oh my God. There in front of me was the most beautiful bald head, hugest smile, and flowing gold and maroon robes. And the first thing that came to my mouth was, are you a Tibetan Buddhist monk? <laughs> and he says, ha 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 ha, yes I am. Do you have polysporin eye drops? And I didn't want to tell him I didn't work there, right? So I'm just like, oh, oh, here, I, I think this is it. He goes, thank you very much. And he says, uh, are you a Buddhist? And I said, no, but, you know, I totally think it's cool. <laughs> and he said, he pulls out this name card, you know, in the, in, if you're Asian, like, when you, it, we don't call it business card, it's name card. And when you present it, it's always a two finger. He goes, please, this is my name card. I said, oh, thank you. Please, come, come for meditation. I said, but where, where, where? where? And he goes, in uh, west of Vancouver, on the mountain. And I'm like, what? I'm like, okay. I said, thank you, thank you. And I'm, I didn't know what to do, right? So I'm like, Nam namaste, you know? <laughs> and he's like, ha, ha, ha. And in the Tibetan faith, um, they say, tashi de lei, right? So, and I'm like, tashi de lei. So, you know, and then I leave, right? And then I go straight up to my office and ring. Hello? Anna? Yeah. Guess what? Oh, yeah, I already know. You met the Tibetan Buddhist monk. And I'm like, oh, you're so good. You're so good. All right. Mmm, interesting. Okay. okay, fast track two years. I'm in the jungle. Okay, so there's two stories, but there's not enough time to tell you about the second story. But the jungle has called my soul, not once, but twice. This is the first time. I'm in the jungles of Malaysia, and I am observing, they're called orangutan. That is the proper pronunciation. I'm observing orangutans that are being reintroduced into the wild. And while I'm there, I get totally bitten alive by mosquitoes. And like... I am not so great about getting vaccines. And anyways, there is no vaccine for dengue fever. So um, w uh, do not recommend it. Uh, it. This was the most horrible experience of my life. So I, I don't know if anyone here is a medical practitioner, but I will, if you're not, I'll tell you what the symptoms are. It is a pain, obviously, um, tons of sweating, chills, feeling like you have, uh, your bones are melting from the inside out, um, pain, um, and, and guess what? A, there's no vaccine for it, and B, the only Western medical treatment is acetaminophen, which is Tylenol. And I'm, say, I'm like, I am suffering, right? And I'm like, Tylenol, that's it? And they're like, yeah. 
take it every four hours, drink lots of water, it should go away, but we don't know when, soon. So, you know, thank goodness I know a little bit about traditional Chinese medicine because, you know, I ended up treating myself very holistically and I use herbs and acupuncture and believe it or not, I was able to fast track this illness except there was residual fatigue. And that's probably from pushing it really fast. And I had to get back to work. I mean, self-employed, and I'm here to serve, and I'm Asian, so I have a mother, so I get back to work. So I did. Ooh, mmm, dramatic. <laughs> All right. So this is where the vulnerable part comes in. Hang on here. I just want to make sure I don't cry. Okay. Uh, Life-changing moment. Okay, before I continue, there's something you need to know. I have no history of drugs, drug use, and no history of mental illness in my family. Got it? Good, great. Let's move on. By the way, this is not my clinic. I don't have any pictures of my clinic, and I borrowed this one off the internet. So, <laughs> but it is quite nice, isn't it? So, I go back to work. Remember, I'm still feeling residual fatigue, but I don't have any pain, I don't have any chills, I don't have the storming, uh, like steaming bone sensation, that's all gone. Okay, two things happened when I went back to work that have never happened to me before. So the first one is this. So you can imagine, right, we've got this beautiful setting, you know, I'm all about environment, so we've got like the nice music going, and it's warm, and it's cozy. I got the flannel sheets, and so the patient's lying down totally cozy. I tucked him in, you know, and he's just about falling asleep because it's so comfortable. And in Chinese medicine, we take the pulse, and from the pulse, we can learn a lot. That's a whole different lecture, so we'll just get to the point. I'm taking the pulse, and I'm sitting on a little rolly chair that I love, and I'm closing my eyes, okay? So I'm in, I'm closing my eyes, I'm feeling the pulse, my shoulders start to drop, I'm getting totally sucked into the warm environment, the cozy music, and this is what happened. <laughs> I totally nodded off. I totally did. And then I woke up, look, patient's falling asleep. Bonus! Oh. But, you know, I totally got it. At that time, I am so not well, and I really shouldn't be at work. Okay, so, let me tell you. You know that, this is called the altered states of consciousness. When I closed my eyes, and I totally sunk in, I hit that sweet spot between wake and sleep. This is this area, or the moment, where radical healings take place. This is where miracles take place. Scientists don't understand why. It just is, right? So if you're doing shamanic journeying, if you're doing plant spirit medicine, if you're doing meditation, you can get into these altered states of consciousness. Guess what? I did it spontaneously. And then I did the second thing I've never done in my life and I wasn't a religious person, I did the spontaneous prayer, and it sounded like this. Dear God, if there is a God, I'm truly here to serve. My heart is in the right place. But I'm sick, and I can't do this alone. Oh, I'm getting emotional. Please help me be of service. Thank you. It wasn't that dramatic, but I just really like this picture. But something did happen to me. Here I am, with my hand still on the pulse, patients now snoring, I am totally in this altered state of consciousness, and in my third eye, a woman appeared, a vision of beauty. It was so freaking spectacular that, and I was so tired, I didn't even question it. I was just like, whoa, like that. I remember everything about it like it was yesterday. Golden headdress with little jewels in it, beautiful flowing ancient Asian gown, Asian face, the sweetest face I've ever seen. And she looked at me, pierced me with her eyes, and she stuck her finger out and said, you ready? And in my third eye, telepathically, I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> and she said, ask the patient this, ask the patient that, 
ask the patient this. So I wake up the patient, and I start asking him all these medical questions. Now, here's the cool thing. My ego and my intellect went out the door. I was completely, utterly in an intuitive stream of consciousness. And I did everything she said without thinking. I just did it. I surrendered. And everybody that got treatment that day was like, whoa, Dr. G, what's up? <laughs> Partly because I wasn't speaking much, but second of all, they felt something different. Fast track, three weeks later. This vision stayed with me the whole entire time. Every single hour of my working day, she was there. The rest of the time, I was sleeping. And she still, she's permanently with me, as she is probably with you, too. Okay, fast track three weeks later, I get a phone call from my friend Janet. She's like, hey, Tanya, hi, Janet. What are you doing on the weekend? Nothing. You know, you have always had a keen interest in Buddhism, and I lovingly invite you to come to our temple. And I said, what? Where? Where? Where's this temple? And she said, West Vancouver, on the mountain. So I'm rummaging around in my wallet, and I pull out this name card, and I said, Janet, is that 3111 Mill Stream Road? She goes, yeah. I said, is it, um, let me see if I can pronounce this, uh, Jelton Solzhen Rinpoche? And she's like, Jelton Solzhen Rinpoche, that is the head monk from our temple, yes. I said, holy cow, I'm in. And she's like, oh, by the way, they made a documentary about him, about how he managed to walk over the Himalayan mountains from Tibet into Nepal, and how he survived, and how he came to Canada. It's showing tomorrow night on the Knowledge Network. You should watch it. So I did. And what I found out was amazing things. This man survived, one, walking across the Himalayan mountains. And he was also an incredible painter. So I was so stoked, and so I showed up on Sunday. And I, I opened the door of the temple, and he was actually on the other side. And we got eye to eye, and I went, hey, I met you two years ago, hi. And he's like, ha, 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 hello, please, come in, come in. And then, you know, I, had, I got seated, and I experienced this amazing service. Mm, interesting. And this is him here, with hair. This is a rare picture of him with hair. Um, his name is His Holiness, Reme Jelton Soljan Rinpoche. Rinpoche is the title you're given if you're a reincarnated master. And so, anyways, I... I had such a wonderful service, and when you're new, you get to be seated in a big table, and you can have cookies and tea, and if you have a question, you can ask him. So apparently, I didn't know this, but anyone who sees this documentary, it's called Call It Karma, you always kind of ask yourself, how did he survive? So I said, um, Rinpoche, may I please ask you a question? He said, ha, 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 yes. I said, how did you survive walking across the Himalayan mountains? And apparently, this is the standard joke response. He goes, ha, 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 lucky. <laughs> and so every time he says it, like everyone who's there starts roaring laughter, and I'm sitting there going. <laughs> and then he, I said, Rinpoche, did you bring back any of those beautiful paintings that you had when you were in Tibet? And he goes, ha, ha, ha. He calls me Taya because he can't pronounce Tanya. And Taya is a, a typical Tibetan word. So he goes, ha, 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 Taya, you want to see the pictures? I said, yes, I would love to. And so he takes me around the corner. And on this like metal rack, it had like maybe 10 of these paintings. They're called tankas. They're sacred paintings. And each one has beautiful silk coverings. And so, you know, he's looking at this one. And he pulls over this, this beautiful silk covering. And, he's, and I'm like, ooh. Oh, that's nice, right? And then he takes over the second one, and, um, and he's telling me what it is. I'm like, oh, how beautiful. Look at the technique of painting. And then the third one came over, and I went, oh, and then I passed out. And when I came to, I was sweating, I was nauseous, I was crying, and I'm like, oh my God, who is that? And he is laughing as he's rolling it up. And I said, who is this woman? She's been coming in my mind's eye. Who is it? And he said, ha, 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 Taya. This is a white Tara, Buddhist deity for compassion and healing. And I'm like having a conniption, right? <laughs> I am like, I got, I got the tissues in my hand. I'm like, I can't believe it. I don't know what to do with this. And then he said, so cute. He says, looks me straight in the eye. He goes, ha, Taya. 
This has happened in Tibet many times, in the West, not so much. <laughs> and so then he ends up giving me this, this tanka, and he said, please, uh, you pay me when you can, and you please take care of her. So uh, this is another picture, and I've actually brought the original with me. Um, and I invite you to, to take, a pic, take a look, take a picture, whatever you want to do. Don't sign it, don't put your fingerprints on it. But uh, it's very dear to me. So a little side note here. Um, I'm just going to get this little... Okay, see this color here, this green? I'm just going to do a quick side note. Um, this tanka was in my presence and in my home for many years. And then when I opened up my clinic, uh, I thought, I'm going to call it the Bodhi Tree Healing Center because the Buddha got enlightened under the Bodhi Tree and I was doing a name search. Nobody had it. So I'm like, oh, that's brilliant. And then a friend of mine said, do you need help painting? I said, oh, that'd be so great. She goes, you should have a feature wall. I said, sure, that'd be great. And she mixed all of this remnant paint that we had in the, in the office and it turned out to be the exact same color as this green. So the whole wall is green that matches there. And when I put it up, I started to cry. And I said, oh my God, this, we made this for her. She was guiding it all the time, the whole time. Oh, ooh, mm, wow. <clears throat> so when I met Carolyn, um, it, it came about that, that I shared that I had done a, a six month nunship as a Buddhist and she's like, no way. And I'm like, yeah way. And she's like, you wanna talk about it? I said, no. <laughs> But I'm um, just teasing. I, I'm going to talk a little bit, just a little bit. So this whole experience, we call it Buddhist shamanism, okay? It, it, it's not ordinary. I'm, and I'm not here to tell you that I'm special like Rohan was saying. I'm here to say mystical things happen all the time. And um, if we were to take the teachings from these experiences and remain humble, um, it could guide you in ways you'd never, ever imagine. And that's why I haven't really talked about it, because I didn't want to like, get my ego involved. I didn't want to say, hey, come to my practice, because she runs through me. No, you know what? She's helped me to learn the terrains of my heart. And without a doubt now, and I know that the pattern was there right when I was young. It's like we're here to serve, right? And that's what yoga is too, right? We're here to serve. We're here to love. That's all that matters, right? So here I am. Um, doing a three years of intensive Buddhist study. Um, and then within those three years, I did a six month nunship, which required me to have a vow of celibacy, to uh, dress modestly, to do at least six hours of meditation and chanting and scripture reading, and be involved with all of the serv services at the temple and be a volunteer and whatnot. And I did it lovingly. Now, the funny thing about this is no one thought I would finish it. And when I first started it, I said, Ah, Rinpoche, yes, Taya. I said, I'm totally prepared to shave my head. And I'm just, when will you want to do this? And he looked at me so lovingly and smiled and goes, Ha, 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 Taya, you get to through the six months first, and then we talk about your hair. So, unbeknownst to me, they were all giggling and laughing because they said, nah, she'll never make it. And so I made it to six months, and at the end of it, uh, he asked me to have a, a conversation. And he said, ah, Taya, uh, you want to extend your Buddhist nun vow? I said, no, thank you. And he said, ha, 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 I knew it. And then I said, uh, and he goes, uh, why? Why do you not want to do this? And I said, Rinpoche, I discovered something really profound. And he said, oh, what is that, Taya? I said, during all of my time in this intense study, I noticed one significant thing that has really profoundly changed me. And he said, oh, what is that, Taya? I said, I realized that I was addicted to drama. And I said, and in this study, I became free of drama. And in this state of being free of drama, I experienced deep, profound peace. I had experience a level of loving detachment that I've never experienced before, and it scared me. It made me think, if I'm not here to feel, why, why, what is this? It doesn't make sense to me. And he looked at me and he says, it's okay, Taya. Maybe you're not ready. Maybe you need to mature a little bit, but maybe this is not your path. And I thanked him, I continued, 
Okay, parting wisdom. How much time do I have? <laughs> do I have a minute? Okay. Um, the wise words of Rinpoche. Maybe this is in the right path. And um, from this point on, I expanded my spiritual quest. Um, a whole different story. I won't talk about that. But uh, I now um, study the jungle. I study the medicines of the jungle. I am learning of that all faiths are saying the same thing. And of course, all that matters is love, right? And when we practice any of these modalities, what it comes down to is this, consciousness. All these serendipitous things that happen to you, all of these, like Monique will know, all of these magical things that happen to you, the people that you meet, the experiences you, you have, the feelings you feel, are leading you to an opportunity to awaken consciousness, consciously, right? Consciousness, I call it. Your spiritual retirement plan, and I have to give full credit to my friend Kristen who said that to me, my mouth dropped open. I thought, oh, that's brilliant. Because consciousness is the only thing you take with you when you die, consciousness. So all you lovely, beautiful, innocent, love, compassionate hearts, I wish you great consciousness in your heart, great peace, great love. And what would Rinpoche say? Thank you.